Okay, state recognized person of jury, does the defense, members of the jury, did you heed all my previous admonitions? Ms. Uh, Burdick, you may continue. At the break, we were speaking of Lee Anthony's effort to convince his sister Casey of her need to just tell Cindy, their mother, where Kaylee Anthony was. That resisting, fighting, just not giving the information was counterproductive and would ultimately result in the same ending regardless. That whether or not Casey did it, or Lee did it, or the police did it, that they were all going to see Kaylee that night. However, in a pattern that is repeated throughout this case, when Casey Anthony's lie can no longer stand, when she can't get out of the corner that she has painted herself into, when her back is up against the wall, and when the stakes increase, what does Casey Anthony do? What does she do? Casey Anthony comes up with a new, a bigger, and a better lie. It is at this point, with her back against the wall, with her brother telling her that the result of this disagreement that you are having with our mother will end in our mother's favor, that Casey Anthony first says these words. Kaylee was kidnapped by the babysitter. The babysitter that nobody has ever seen, that nobody ever saw, that her parents didn't know, that her brother had never heard of. Kaylee has been kidnapped by Zenaida Fernandez Gonzalez. And upon hearing this information, all Kaylee's Uncle Lee could think of was nothing. He goes into vapor lock. He can't believe his ears. He has to focus now on solving this problem. And even though Cindy Anthony, the evidence will show, had to realize that her daughter had lied and lied and lied and lied for 31 days about where she was, about where Kaylee was, about what they were doing. At that moment, Cindy Anthony had to believe her daughter. Although her first response, according to the testimony that you'll hear from Lee Anthony, is, what did you do? Her first response directed at Casey Anthony, what did you do? And at that point, this story, the evidence will show, had its desired effect to take the focus off of Casey Anthony. Her mother was in her face. Her brother is in her face. How do you get out of that? You tell another lie. Cindy Anthony goes into an all-out panic 
At this point, 911 again, the third time on the phone, and you will hear Cindy Anthony's panic 911 call to the Orange County Sheriff, the third call she made that day. And this time she is hysterical. Cindy Anthony wants Casey Anthony to speak to the dispatcher on the phone. You can hear the exchange. And then you can hear Casey Anthony get on the phone like nothing. With the attitude, well, why do you people want to talk to me? I don't want to talk to them. During this call, Cindy Anthony tells the dispatcher from the Orange County Sheriff's Office that her granddaughter was kidnapped. I cannot find my granddaughter. Something is wrong. It smells like there's been a dead body in the damn car. As you will learn, as this trial unfolds, the Orange County Sheriff's Office, as do all police agencies, keep a almost second by second accounting of their response to a call. You will learn that the first officer that arrived at the Anthony residence was Corporal Brendan Fletcher. Now, Corporal Fletcher's Dispatch was to the second call. So he's not completely apprised until he gets there of the seriousness of this call. Eventually, after learning from Lee Anthony and Cindy Anthony and Casey Anthony in the home that Kaylee is missing and this Zenaida Fernandez Gonzalez has Kaylee, the Orange County Sheriff's Office begins to gather information about locating this person. And one of the things that is told to them by Casey Anthony is that Zanny, or Zanida, lives at the Sawgrass Apartments, which is off of Conway Road in Orlando. So deputies with the Orange County Sheriff's Office ask Casey to show them the last place she saw her daughter 31 days ago. And she gets into the car with Adriana Acevedo, a deputy with the Orange County Sheriff. Brendan Fletcher, the corporal that first responded to the call, follows in case he needs to do follow-up with the people <laughs> at the Sawgrass Apartments. And they drive in to the location at the direction of Casey Anthony. She points out the apartment where she last saw her daughter, Kaylee, and says, that's where I dropped Kaylee off on June 9th, 2008. Brendan Fletcher finds somebody with this complex, somebody in management or maintenance, and it's determined that while this is July, now 16th probably, 2008, nobody's lived in that apartment since February 2008. The prior occupants were evicted.
So when these deputies from the Orange County Sheriff's Office returned to the Anthony home with Casey and no Kaylee, what does Cindy Anthony do? She continues to insist that something be done. That Casey is lying, that somebody needs to arrest her. She needs to tell me where Kaylee is. During this process, deputies send somebody to Tony Lazaro's apartment where Casey's cell phone was. And her belongings were later retrieved by her brother, who went to the apartment. Kaylee Anthony was not there either. One of the things that Casey Anthony told them had to do with having contact information for this Zanny person in her phone. So the deputies retrieve that phone and attempt to get any information that night off of it that they can in an effort to find this person who allegedly has Casey Anthony's daughter, Kaylee. They ask Casey Anthony to put pen and paper. Tell us everything that you can tell us about what happened and about this person that you say kidnapped your daughter. They were there to help find Kaylee Anthony. So what does the evidence show Casey Anthony did? At the first opportunity given to her to put pen to paper, she writes, on Monday, June 9th, 2008, between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m., I, Casey Anthony, took my daughter, Kaylee Marie Anthony, to her nanny's apartment. June 9th. On Monday, June 9th, 2008, the first words written to the Orange County Sheriff about the disappearance of Kaylee Anthony are a lie. This statement is single-spaced, four pages, and during the course of this trial, you have the opportunity to review it, and you will see that it's four pages of lies. The patrol supervisors at the scene of the Anthony's that morning, July 16th, now 2008, decided that they needed to call a detective out to the house to follow up in this investigation, to tell the detective what their findings were, at least preliminarily. While they're waiting for the arrival of the detective, the sergeant on the scene, Reginald Posey, took Casey Anthony on a short walk. There's a cul-de-sac that is two or three houses down from her residence and asked her, is this a, a domestic situation? Is it, is it just a matter of you don't want your mom to have access to your child? And Detective Hosey is left with the impression from Casey Anthony that night 
that this is no big deal. And that our child is fine. At 4 o'clock in the morning on Wednesday, July 16th, Detective Yuri Melch with the Orange County Sheriff's Office first arrives at the Anthony House. He gets a copy or he reviews that handwritten statement of Casey Anthony and he asks to speak with her. She talks with him in a room in the house. He ultimately tape records their conversation and he says is this is this true do you want to change anything on this statement and Casey Anthony says no sir no way this is what happened I'm telling you the truth one of the things that she had relayed to the Orange County Sheriff's Office was that she had a phone, another phone, that was lost at Universal Studios where she worked, that there were people who were employees of Universal Studios who she had told about this situation. Detective Mellich again asked if Casey Anthony could take him to the location where she says she last saw her daughter at the Sawgrass Apartments and she takes him right back to that same place where she took the patrol officers. He asks if there are other people related to this Zenaida Fernandez Gonzalez that he could contact in an effort to locate Kaylee Anthony. She takes him in the area of another residence, supposedly of Zenaida Gonzalez's mother. No one is contacted. Nobody is found. They return to the Hope Spring house with no Kaylee. Casey Anthony goes back in her house, and Yuri Melich begins his investigation. <coughs> And that investigation begins at Universal Studios. Yuri Melich contacts a employee of Universal Studios by the name of Leonard Tutura in an effort to determine where Casey Anthony works, where these other people that she said can be contacted work, how they can be contacted, and Detective Melich learns Casey Anthony doesn't work at Universal Studios. Casey Anthony hasn't worked at Universal Studios for years. These people that she told you were here, they don't work here. So Detective Mellich, with the assistance of his supervisor, Sergeant John Allen, and another detective by the name of Appy Wells, made contact with Casey. The first contact is made by Detective Mellich over the phone, where he calls Casey Anthony and says, you work at Universal Studios, and this is the information verifying what she had told him before. She's like, yes, absolutely, of course. Yes, you're right, that's it. He knows, it's a lie. Maybe they all have it wrong. Maybe if Casey comes out to Universal Studios, we can clear this all up. Maybe we're not getting the names right. Maybe I wrote it down wrong. And she is contacted and agrees to come out to Universal Studios. So Detective Mellich is there with Leonard Tutora and John Allen and Appy Wells go to the Anthony house, pick up Casey Anthony, and she accompanies them to Universal Studios. 
She directs them around the park, just has idle chit chat with them on the way. And they get to the security gate at Universal Studios. And she's denied access. They're suggesting she doesn't work here. They ask her for her identification. She tells them, I forgot it. I, didn't, I don't have it. Leonard Tutura, who's there with Yuri Melich, allows them to come in anyway. And there, Casey Anthony is supposed to show them the office where she works and where she lost her phone or where there might be some information about Zenaida Gonzalez. And you will hear testimony that Casey Anthony walks with purpose through that security gate and heads towards an administration building, walks in and true to what we've seen or you will see during this case is at the end of the hall. And she puts her hands in her back pocket and smiles. All right, I'll work here. Detectives Allen, Wells, and Melich, then speak with Casey Anthony on tape in a conference room at Universal Studios where she admits to them that she's been lying to them about working at Universal. Because that's the lie the evidence will show they caught her in. But she will not waver at that point from her story about the, the nail. So in an effort to find this person she insists exists, the detectives take her from Universal and show her pictures in the driver's license database of individuals with the name Zanaya Gonzalez. She doesn't know any of them. None of these Zanaya Gonzalez's on your driver's license pictures are my Zanaya Gonzalez. At this point, since Casey Anthony admitted to them that she lied during the process of this investigation, she was arrested. And at this point, the investigation, by necessity, takes two different paths. There is the investigation that continued into attempting to locate this person that Casey Anthony insisted had her daughter, this Zenaida Gonzalez. There were tips and phone calls and sightings of Kaylee Anthony all across the country, on airplanes, in, on, in gas stations, all, in, all over the place. Tips that were followed up by members of the Orange County Sheriff's Office, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, local police agencies in different states know Kaylee Anthony and know Zanaya Gonzalez. That night, July 16th of 2008, 
with the permission of George and Cindy Anthony, the Orange County Sheriff's Office seized Casey Anthony's white Pontiac Sunfire. And you will hear testimony from crime scene technicians and ultimately the individuals who evaluated and analyzed evidence taken from that truck during the course of this trial. You will also hear that the trash bag that Simon Birch had thrown out of the car the day before when George Anthony picked up the Sunfire at the Johnson Wrecker was located in the dumpster when George Anthony went with a missing person's civilian investigator to find it. Was there something in that garbage that would help the Orange County Sheriff's Office find his granddaughter? George Anthony wanted to know. On Thursday, July 17th, the Orange County Sheriff's Office had one of their cadaver dogs, which you will hear during the course of this trial, is a dog that is specially trained in detecting the scent of human remains. Do a sweep around the car. Deputy Jason Forgey, who has many years of experience in handling police canines and who has worked with his dog Garris prior to Garris's recent retirement for a long period of time took the dog around the car at which point Garris alerted give a trained final alert which will be explained to you on the trunk of the car as having the odor of human remains. Later that day, Garris was taken to the Anthony residence, where, again, George and Cindy Anthony had given permission to the members of the Orange County Sheriff's Office to look in their yard to see if there was any evidence that would help them learn what happened to Kaylee. Where was Kaylee? And then again, in the backyard near Kaylee's playhouse, Garris alerted to the odor of human decomposition. Deputy Forgey had asked that another canine handler, this one from the Osceola County Sheriff's Office, Kristen Brewer, Sergeant Brewer, brought her cadaver dog to the Anthony home. And her cadaver dog also alerted to the owner of human decomposition near the playhouse in the Anthony's backyard. Now you hear that crime scene technicians dug up in the areas where the dogs alerted did not find Kaylee. Evidence from the car was also preserved. Hair air samples, samples from the carpet lining the trunk, samples from the spare tire cover were cut and collected in tin cans by members of the Orange County Sheriff's Office. Samples of 
Casey Anthony's DNA, Lee Anthony's DNA, Cindy and George Anthony's DNA, and a hairbrush that was used by Kaylee to get a sample of her DNA was obtained. The hair and other debris collected from Casey Anthony's Pontiac Sunfire was sent to the Federal Bureau of Investigations Laboratory in Quantico, Virginia. And you will hear that the evidence and testimony in this case establishes that forensic science has discovered that there is a distinctive band of discoloration that occurs at the root end of a hair under very specific and unique circumstances. According to these scientific studies, you will hear this artifact occurs only and has only been seen in hairs taken from decomposing human bodies. Of the many hairs that were found in the trunk of the Sunfire, one hair exhibited the classic characteristics that I just described. This supports the prior investigative findings, not only as it relates to the alerts by the trained cadaver dogs, but also the ability of those people who have smelled a dead body before to know what it is. These findings led to the inescapable conclusion that in fact a dead body had been in the trunk of Casey Anthony's car. And you will learn that the FBI compared the hair that I just described to hair collected from Kaylee Anthony's hairbrush through the use of mitochondrial DNA, which will be explained during the course of the trial, as well as microscopic analysis and determined through the unique characteristics of the hair that they were indistinguishable from those of Kaylee Anthony. The testimony in this case regarding the analysis of this hair will convince you that it was the hair of Kaylee Marie Anthony that was found in that trunk. Nevertheless, in order to further establish the nature of the odor emanating from Casey Anthony's trunk at that point, the Orange County Sheriff's Office contacted an individual who is the leading expert in the field of the biochemistry of the odor of human decomposition. That individual, Arpad Voss, or Dr. Arpad Voss, will be testifying for you during this trial. And in 20 years of studying the chemistry of the odor of decomposition, he has spent the last 10 concentrating on identifying the chemical composition of the very distinctive odor of decomposition of human decomposition. Dr. Voss will tell you that when he opened this can that was collected by the Orange County Sheriff's Office that contained samples of the spare tire cover in the trunk of Casey Anthony's car, he immediately recognized the unmistakable odor of human decomposition. Now you will learn that his research and others' research into this area is ongoing. And he will tell you about the instrumental analysis that he performed on the odor from the substance, from this piece of spare tire cover taken from the trunk of Casey Anthony's car. What you will learn is that these compounds are consistent with a decompositional event occurring in the trunk of the car, possibly of human origin. But Dr. Voss will also tell you that during his analysis of those pieces of spare tire cover, 
that he found something unexpected. His instrumental analysis found the highest concentration of chloroform that he's ever seen. And while he will tell you that small amounts of chloroform have been found in human decomposition under specific circumstances, his analysis of the evidence in this case showed a concentration of chloroform thousands of times greater than he had seen produced by human decomposition alone. The amount that he detected simply cannot be accounted for by human decomposition alone. You also hear that different sections of this same spare tire comp uh, cover, the samples from it were in sent to the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Crime Laboratory, and they independently confirmed through separate analysis the presence of chloroform. Upon receipt of this information, the Orange County Sheriff's Office detectives contacted the forensic computer analysts with their agency. You will learn that of the items collected from the Anthony household, one was a desktop computer. The hard drive from that desktop computer had been in the possession of the Orange County Sheriff's Office since July 16th or 17th of 2008. And when this information was passed along to these examiners, uh, based on Dr. Voss's findings, which occurred at the end of August or beginning of September of 2008, <laughs> the computer analysts were asked to perform a keyword search of the hard drive of that desktop computer for the word chloroform. And you will hear, in this case, testimony from Sandra Osborne, who is a forensic computer examiner, that her analysis of the computer revealed searches on March 17th and March 21st of 2008. What you will hear is that internet searches were conducted by a user in the Anthony home using Google. You will hear that on Monday, March 17th of 2008, between 1.43 and 1.55 in the afternoon, Google searches were done on that computer for the words chloroform, alcohol, acetone, and peroxide. You will hear that on Friday, March 21st, 2008, between the hours of 2.16 and 2.28 p.m., Google searches were conducted for, quote, how to make chloroform, quote, how to make chloroform with a different spelling, quote, self-defense, quote, household weapons, quote, neck breaking, quote, shovel. In addition to those Google searches, there were Wikipedia searches conducted on March 17, 2008, between the hours of 1.53 and 1.58 p.m. for the words inhalation, chloroform, alcohol, acetone, peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, and death. On Friday, March 23rd, excuse me, Friday, March 21st, 2008, between 2.16 and 2.28, PM, a Wikipedia search was done for the word shovel. Also on that date, there were searches using websites blogspot.com, sizespot.com, druglibrary.org, instructables.com for these words, quote, making weapons out of household products, quote, chloroform habit, 
quote, chloroform, quote, how to make chloroform, and quote, chloro-2. You will learn that Cindy Anthony was working on those days and at those times. You will learn on March 21st, George Anthony was working on those days and at those times. And you will learn from the forensic computer examiners that the context, searches surrounding before and after, these searches were done on that laptop, excuse me, on that desktop computer at the Anthony home, reveal that there could have been no other user making those searches than Casey Anthony. You will hear that despite the mounting evidence that made it more and more obvious as we got into September of 2008 that Kaylee Anthony was dead, that the Orange County Sheriff's Office and many thousands of private citizens continue to search for her. These search efforts you will hear in many areas were hampered by the passage of time, <coughs> and standing water that was created by Tropical, Tropical Storm Bay in late August of 2008. Many additional attempts were made to locate this Zenaida Fernandez Gonzalez. She's never been seen. George and Cindy Anthony held out hope that their precious granddaughter would be found alive. However, on a rainy Thursday morning, December 11, 2008, the Orange County Sheriff's Office received a call from a dispatcher at Orange County Utilities. The Sheriff's Office at that time was informed that a tiny human skull had been found in the woods off of Suburban Drive. This was in walking distance of Kaylee's home and within sight of the elementary school where she would be at this very moment if she were alive. Examination of that scene revealed that the body of Kaylee Marie Anthony had been wrapped in a Winnie the Pooh blanket, stuffed into multiple garbage bags, shoved into a laundry bag, and thrown into a littered swamp like she was just another piece of trash. A forensic anthropologist will describe to you that all that remained of Kaylee Anthony were her scattered bones, remnants of the clothes that she was wearing, and pieces of the plastic bags that had entombed her. For 10 days, crime scene personnel from the Orange County Sheriff's Office, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation painstakingly worked on their hands and knees, sifting, digging, re-sifting, collecting evidence, and collecting the remains of Kaylee Anthony to ensure to make certain that she would no longer suffer the indignity of lying in a wooden swamp. The evidence by its very appearance, and you will see hundreds of the thousands of photographs taken in this case, and by its very appearance, you will be able to conclude that Kaylee, spent many months 
in that swamp. Roots encircled the blanket, grew through the blanket. They encircled her hair. They wrapped themselves into the bags that she was in. <coughs> As you have seen in the photograph, taken at the scene on December 11th of 2008, duct tape covered the nose and mouth area of that tiny human skull. The cotton and polyester backing of that duct tape was disintegrating in the harsh environment in which she lay. You will learn that three pieces of overlapping duct tape covered the nose and mouth of Kaylee Anthony. You will learn that the duct tape was placed on her prior to decomposition as it held the mandible or the jaw to the head. You will learn that the duct tape was stuck in the hair, indicating that Kaylee's killer never intended that it be removed. You will learn that the brand and style of the duct tape are distinctive and not widely available. You will learn that the Orange County Sheriff's Office executed a search warrant on the Anthony residence late in the evening of December 11th of 2008 and discovered that the gas cans that Kaylee, Casey Anthony took from her dad on June 23rd of 2008 had a piece of duct tape identical in appearance to the tape covering Kaylee's nose and mouth. You will learn that a chemist from the Federal Bureau of Investigation determined that the tape was manufactured at the same time using the same methods. You will learn that the duct tape, identical in appearance to that on Kaylee Anthony's face, was used at the end of July on a missing <coughs> child poster of Kaylee Anthony. You will hear that the pieces of shirt that remained and the plastic logo that once appeared on that shirt, Big Trouble comes in small packages, were captured in photos of Kaylee and Casey Anthony taken in January and March of 2008. You will learn that Kaylee's Winnie the Pooh blanket was missing from her house. You will learn that a Whitney Design laundry bag was located in the, in the garage of the Anthony home, and the matching bag was missing from the house. You will learn that upon autopsy, there was no evidence of any trauma to Kaylee's bones. And you will learn that the only evidence indicating the cause of death of Kaylee Marie Anthony are the three pieces of duct tape covering her nose and mouth. The evidence in this case will establish that there is no other reason for the placement of multiple pieces of duct tape on this child's face, mouth, and nose other than the specific intent to end that child's life. As difficult as it may be for anyone to accept that a mother would intentionally kill her own child, from the evidence that you will hear in this case, there is no other conclusion that can be drawn. Kaylee Marie Anthony was not kidnapped by a nanny or any other person. No one but Casey Anthony had access to all the pieces of evidence in this case 
the duct tape, the laundry bag, the blanket, the shorts, the shirt, the car. No one else lied to their friends, to their family, to investigators. No one else benefited from the death of Kaylee Marie Anthony. Kaylee's death allowed Casey Anthony to live the good life, at least for those 31 days. At the end of this case, you will have no trouble concluding that Kaylee Anthony was murdered by her mother, Casey Anthony. And at the conclusion of all of the evidence and argument in this case, we will be asking you to return a verdict that reflects the truth of what happened to Kaylee Anthony. And that is that Casey Anthony is guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. Thank you all for your attention. Okay, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we're going to recess a little early for lunch. We will return here at one uh, ten uh, to hear uh, the opening statements from the defense. I'm going to ask you while you're at lunch not to read, watch, or listen to any news accounts, nor discuss this case among yourselves, and do not uh, engage in any Internet searches. You need additional instructions on behalf of the state or the defense. Okay, members of the jury, maybe in recess for lunch.